started. So our, our webinar today is the second part in the series about that uh, essentially all about the chick. We had uh, first part, part one last week from Alene um, Kuntz from Avigen talked about assessing chick quality in the hatchery. And then today's um, webinar will be from uh, Dr. Scott Gillingham from Avigen as well. Um, Scott has um, been with Avigen for almost 20 years now. He's a Canadian reg regional yeah. business consultant with Avigen. Um, done a lot in this area of, of getting the best from our three and seven day um, livability from our chicks once they get out of the hatchery out to the farm. He's wrote a book about it, uh, produced a very good uh, video. It's on YouTube. 400,000 hits, I think, is what heard a lot, a lot of uh, good information. I heard a lot of positives back from that as well, and I've watched it, and it's very informational as well. So that'll be our um, speaker today, but first, let me give you a little bit of um, uh, information at first. You will get a copy of this. Those are registered. We'll get an email after the fact that we'll have a link to this presentation, so you can watch, watch it later, slow it down share it with other people. So um, we get a lot of questions and say, hey, can we have a copy of this? You'll get a link to it. So you will have a copy later um, as well. Any questions we may not get to in this, uh, the live portion of this webinar, we will try to get those answered afterwards um, by email. Down at the bottom of your screen there, there's a Q&A box. Um, and if you have questions um, at any time during the presentation, then just uh, type them in that box and, um, We'll get them at the end. Like I said, time permitting, we'll get to everything. If not, then you'll get them after the fact, but um, we'll, we'll try to get as much as we can. Um, may not add, ask your question exactly in the wording because I might combine it with some other very similar type of questions, but we'll do our best to get everything answered. So type those in the Q&A box, and then at, at, when Scott's done, we will address those um, live uh, and get as many of them as we can. So we're very pleased to have Scott join us today. Um, a very good speaker, very animated speaker, a lot of experience, not just with Avigen, with other areas in the poultry industry. And uh, with that, I will um, turn this over to Scott, let him load up his presentation, and I will um, still be here, but you won't see my face for a little while. You'll just see Scott and his presentation. So Scott, go ahead Thanks. and take over. Thank you. I just want to take the opportunity to thank Keith and the James Way team for allowing me to come and give this presentation. Um, I couldn't do it from my rural home because Wi-Fi and interference and the bandwidth was not there. And I was happy to come into the office. Um, self distancing, et cetera, has been practiced and really grateful to the team for the hospitality that they've shown me. I never thought that this would come in so handy. This is my brawn chick thermometer that we do vent temps for. What I did have to remember was to change the cap when I started using it for my wife and I just to check our temperatures and the daily <laughs> patterns. So um, this has come in really handy. Um, I really did not know that we would need it for this time or situation, but it's just one way of, of checking and self-assessing how we go through the process. Um, my name is Scott Gillingham. I was born in Northern Quebec. Yeah. Scott, you yeah. can go ahead and share your screen if you want. This okay. one. And um, I was born in Northern Quebec and uh, went to school in Vermont and did my Bachelor of Science down there. And then I went to the city of Guelph to do my DVM degree. During that process, I've been in the field a lot. I've worked for pharma companies. I was a provincial veterinarian. And now I've had, been blessed to work with a company called um, Aviagen. Um, I am the regional business consultant for the country, handle all businesses from sales to technical support, veterinarian, et cetera and have a great team around me. Traveling globally, you get to see a lot of opportunity with respect to chicken and production. Uh, giving talks in Ethiopia for the World Poultry Foundation, traveling through Latin America and Canada, um, there is no set way of growing chicken. There is no template in growing chicken. Uh, one cannot say that this is the template, these are the rules and regulations for growing chicken in the first seven days. So you need to audit the process. And with this, Scott, we have Scott real quick, can you go up on your display settings and change it up? We have speaker view on right now so they can see okay. the whole thing. So display settings up on the top. Uh, on the top, very top of there. No, very top okay. where it says display settings. Display set there? No, right there. Okay. 
and change it, change, click that and change it to um, presentation rather than speaker view. Presentation, duplicate slideshow. So do that one right there. Right there? Yeah, that first one right there. There? Yeah, that should do it. It didn't do it though. There we go. Yeah, that's what we want right there. All right, All great. Right. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, Thank you. This out of the way. Sorry, folks. So I've had the opportunity to come in and talk about chick quality and livability. And uh, we're gonna go through the first three to seven days, not the growing period or the finishing period, but really get a good handle on what we're trying to explain to try to create that opportunity for chick vitality and performance. Um, no doubt the purpose of all this is to give the checks the best start, right? We wanna provide the correct brooding setup. That is the key to, for subsequent flock welfare, uniformity and performance. No doubt we want to get that performance in the first seven days because we will not get that back. These are neonates. They can't thermoregulate during those period of time. And what we don't do during that period for optimum performance, we won't get it back. Yes, there's genetic potential, <clears throat> but rooting is not 100% genetics. We really, if we want to look at this whole idea of field performance, we need to focus on management. We need to put man back into management. We need to look at the environment those chicks are going to be placed in. We have to look at health measures and nutrition. Again, rooting is not 100% genetics. It's not 100% heritable. It doesn't matter if it's leg arms or broilers or turkeys. There's no such thing as 100% heritability <clears throat> for early brooding. Field performance, of course, we have to optimize and enhance that genetic potential through management, environment, health, and definitely nutrition. What we could do, I guess, when we leave our chicks in the barn or bring the chicks to the barn, we can leave a teacher behind. We can leave one bird in the barn and they can teach the chicks where the feed and water is. And you know I'm being facetious. We want to start clean. We want to start with our day old chicks in the barn. We don't need a teacher in the barn to show the chicks where feed and water is or the comfort zone. It's all in our hands. And when I give presentations, I try to emphasize the fact that it is in our control. It is in our hands. We are the mama chicken. We need to provide that optimal environment. We have to provide the right environmental controls, the managerial inputs, etc., to get that chick off to a good start. We are the mama chicken. And again, I've given a lot of talks to backyard farmers, to farmers across our globe, and I don't care if you have three chickens, 30 chickens, 30, 300 chickens, 3,000, 30,000, or 300,000, the principles are the same. And this is what we hope to discuss. Currently, with the growth that we're, we're seeing in our chickens today, um, we need to take leadership. And that means data. We can't just inspect anymore. We need to write down what we do, do what we write down, and prove it. We need to audit the process. And a big thing that I'm talking about today in my talks is you cannot manage what you do not measure. We need to be able to have the data, review the data to create dialogue and hopefully not discipline, but if we need to do discipline, that will follow based on our data. Charity starts at home, okay? So as a brooding, as a percentage of total flock life, I'm getting the 17518 kilo bird in some provinces of Canada in 28 days. That tells me that the percentage of brooding is going to be higher and higher and higher during that total flock life, right? We need to spend time in those first seven to 10 days. It is becoming definitely more of a, of the total life flock is definitely our brooding. There's going to be less time to, to get out of the trouble afterwards. There's not a lot of room for error. These birds are like a race car. It's a 100-yard dash. It's not a marathon. You trip and fall, it's going to be hard to catch up. So we need to pay attention 24-7 to these birds as we go forward. Now, Aline gave a talk last week on hatchery. What I really emphasize in my travels is this triangle of interaction. Chick quality is not just about the chick or the hatchery. It's about a triangle of interaction. It's about the breed industry paying attention to detail. It's about the quality of that egg set. It's about hatchery paying attention to the detail, of course, and our broiler industry to get this bird off to a good start. Why? We want performance. 
We want welfare attributes. We want sustainability. We want performance. We want profit per square foot or profit per square meter. But above all, we want chicken uniformity and health, right? 21 days to grow a chicken. We just don't set the incubation at 504 or 21 days. I'm not an expert in incubation. Keith is and Aline, and we have those people in the field. That is not going to change. But 35% of a growing life of a bird is during incubation with a 39 day growing period. So again, we need to pay attention to, the, to, to hatchery. On breeders, it's quality egg set, right? We need breeder gut health. We need hatchability. We need fertility. We need uniformity and consistency. And above all, we need good vaccination programs to provide that maternal antibody that's going to be transferred through the yolk to the chick. So breeders are important too. However, for our talk for today, we need to talk about chick management. How do we put man back into management? Women are involved too, but I have trouble pronouncing woman and management. Women make excellent um, personnel in terms of brooding and paying attention to detail in the barn, but this is a real opportunity for people to pay attention to chick health and chick opportunities moving forward. Farm preparation. We hope we can clean and disinfect the farm prior to chick arrival. I do know that in some areas of the world, they put chicks on built up litter, but that litter could be tilled. It could be top dressed with litter treatment products, etc. But the important thing is that we need to have consistency in our approach, right? We can spread the litter evenly to a depth of five to 10 centimeters, two to four inches. And when I say litter, it could be peanut hulls, it could be shavings, it could be chopped straw, uh, long straw, it could be sand, it could be chopped paper, etc. The key is to provide that insulation barrier from the ground up to provide that opportunity for, for moisture and absorption, etc. Um, that, that the chick will not be exposed to. We want to preheat the house for 24 hours. If you saw my video that I did for the Chicken Farmers of Ontario, um, that was done in January. It was minus 30 degrees centigrade outside. In that situation, we're going to have to heat the house up a lot more than just 24 hours prior to chick arrival. But the important thing is, is what? It's what is the air temperature and also what is the temperature of the litter where the birds will be exposed to and make the contact. Relative humidity, in some parts of the world, we can have 15% humidity, in some areas up to 70% humidity. But we really want to have that humidity that's going to be appropriate for chick health and chick vitality in the first three to seven days. We want to make sure that feed and water is available immediately. I prefer this. Some people might say I'm wrong. I am not an expert. I do know that once I'm in an environment where chicks are, I want to sit on a five gallon pail upside down and really analyze what is going on. How are the birds received at that time of placement? But more importantly, what are they perceiving? People say that, well, they need to be on water right away. Uh, they need to be on feed right away. If the bird is hatched well, VAP rates, yield rates, all paid attention to. Chicks are brought to the farm under proper environmental control in the truck um, or, or container. Then that bird should have a choice. I think the bird might want to rest. A chick might want to search and gather. It might want to go and look for a comfort zone. It might even seek for feed and water. So that's why I want to sit on a five gallon bucket for, and watch the chick's behavior. Okay, that is what's critical. 12 birds per nipple, whether you use bell founts, et cetera, abide by barn inventory. How many birds per nipple? How many birds per bell found? How many birds per feed pan, trough, et cetera? Stick to barn inventory that works for the birds under those situations. Okay, what is chick quality? Aline gave a great presentation on that. On the farm, we're not going to do look at yolk, chick weights, etc., or shank length, but you have the opportunity. You have the opportunity to take the chick and look at it. Is the beak straight? Are they cross beaked? How is it clean? Is there dirty feathers? Is there eggshell stuck to the feathers? How are the, the nail, are the navels healed? Are they stringing navels? Are they active and curious or all subdued and lethargic? Is there strong legs? Is there red hawks? Is there scaly? Is the vent clean? How would the feathers look? Are they happy sounding, chirping, et cetera, bright eyes? You can do this on farm. 
And I really, really uh, promote this, that when the chicks arrive, just don't simply place them, or if you do place them, take time to look at them, observe them. You need to look at the chick, and if there is some challenges, communicate. Don't live in a silo and retain that information to yourself. Communicate to the hatchery. Work as a team. Together, everyone achieves more. One in one is 11, not two. Take these, op op these challenges and turn them into an opportunity through communication. I actually copyrighted the word floss. Food, lighting, air, water, space. You can add another L in there for litter. You can look at security and sanitation, etc. But what I really like to do when I go on farm is to have a systemic or, or systematic way of approaching my visits. I do usually, and then when I worked in herd health, uh, dairy cattle, etc., it was important to try to have a systemic way, a system, a way of analyze what's going on in that premise or in that farm. And I like the word floss, food, lightning, air, water, space, and sanitation. So when I talk about chick quality, when I talk about chick health or brooding, I definitely like to use that acronym. So we'll start with feed. <clears throat> no doubt when chicks arrive, we hope their heart and lungs are functioning. If not, they're going to be dead. But one thing that is important to understand too is what is not working is their gut. We need to make sure that the gut is working and the way to do that is to get them on feed. Right? Many times I hear it's all about the nutrient density. It's all about formulation. Today's feed is usually pretty good. It's a balanced ration of 21 to 23% protein. Um, the energy is there, the vitamin, minerals, etc. Where I really like to spend time is the other half, and that's feed allocation. You know, the product is daily nutrient intake, but we need to have the feed allocated in an area where they can consume this balanced ration. So we can't just always focus on the feed mill. We, we hope and they provide a balanced ration that is conducive for good ch chick health. But it's our job on the farm, when we have our fingers on the pulse, to pay attention where the feed is allocated. And that is also for water, which we'll talk about. Why? Well, once the birds are fed, and we want to try to get them on feed as soon as possible within six hours. We do know that the yolk is absorbed, right? It's called maternal antibody. This is the claustra. When that food is, is, is consumed, it starts that system called peristalsis, gut movement, gut motility. And that yolk is actually squeezed into the gut and provides some nutrient opportunity, but also maternal antibody. Your breeder companies spend a lot of money on live and kill vaccines to promote what? Not only breeder health, but also the provision of maternal antibody to be transferred to the chick. And with real virus and gumboro and a few others of, of the natures that we are exposed to today, this is critical. But that yolk has to be absorbed. We gotta have the gut working. And we do know for gut integrity, villus and crip ratio, crip ratio is important but gut integrity is important for food absorption. We spend a lot of money on feed. Feed is very expensive, and we need to have the gut working and that gut health involved for good gut integrity but absorption of feed. And with more raising without antibiotics, it's also important that we have an immune system that is potentiated. So early feeding is good. And of course, improved growth to marketing and age and breast meat yield, et cetera, that's dollars and cents, that's performance, but it's also uh, uniforming consistency in our production. This chick here, no feed. Scaly legs, that intestinal tract is smaller in diameter. The yolk sac is not, looks like hasn't been absorbed. And as the birds get on feed, our intestinal tract is a larger percentage of body weight, leg health is good, et cetera. So we need to get them on feed. Now, in the video that I did on the YouTube, this is one of the pictures of the barn. And I hope after the presentation that if you see a picture like this, you can start making some opportunities and changes. The lighting is fantastic. There's no doubt the, the, the foot candles are there. The feed pans are actually pressed into the litter so they provide some supplementation. But to me, there's not enough litter on the paper. 
not a, sorry, not enough feed on the paper. That transition is critical. So the approach that I take is, is integrated approach. It's not just inspecting, right? We want that integrated approach, that auditing the process. So we want to get our chicks pulled and processed and delivered and fed as quickly as possible. Yes, water is critical. They will have that choice. But we're starting with the word flaws. The F of flaws is for feed. And this is how we're going to approach um, our brooding principles, right? We want to deliver the feed and get it and get it fed as quickly as possible. The importance of a good start is a presentation of feed. As I said, feed is usually well balanced in protein and energy and vitamin and mineral, but the presentation of the feed is, is important. If it's outside the comfort zone, the birds will huddle and not go to feed. So I like to put feed down in paper or in feedlets because as the chicks walk through it, they actually are quite curious. Their innate behavior is to search and then they just kind of pitter patter through it. I'd much rather them eat the feed if it's available than start eating litter, right? So we wanna feed them as soon as possible when they're on the farm. We wanna get the chicks onto the feed area, not onto the litter. That is critical. The rule of thumb for feed on paper is 50 grams per chick dispersed onto the paper in the first week, right? That is really important as the birds climatize to their new environment. Feed on paper, the nipple lines close by, and then in this situation, they haven't dropped the feed lines yet, largely because they placed the chicks and didn't want them in the way, but now they'll probably look at providing the opportunity for feed hands to be placed into the litter at the area of the chicks' um, uh, movement um, and, and presence. This, chip, this picture, um, there's not enough feed on the paper. When I see five grams of feed per chick, put on the paper and you know a lot of times when I go to oper to farms etc and ask the question have you put feed out on paper and you go yeah we have but the big question is to to really audit the process right? how much did you put down where did you put it down five grams per chick to me is not enough and why is it not enough when that feed is consumed is that transition to automation going to be appropriate and I've seen many times when I look at daily weights the birds on the paper start uh, feed on paper or feedlets start to gain weight. And then there's a transition where there's a stall. And that transition usually is occurring when I don't have enough feed down on paper or in feedlets. And as they're trying to acclimatize to the feedlets, these chicks are not always 100% uniform. At eight o'clock on day three, they're all not going to go to the feeders. There's a bell curve in nature, hopefully not an umbrella curve where you have this huge variability but there will be some going to transition to the feeders sooner than others. Is the feed available to the chicks in the comfort zone to make that transition? The key is transition automation, okay? I've seen where there's a racetrack around a feed pan because it was raised too high and everything has been, how do you say, eaten around the feed pan without the ability of the chick to get in the feed pan to consume the feed. So observation is critical. Um, yeah, I put feed down on paper. I put enough feed down in the barn. Is that how you present feed? Is that supplemental feeding? And here too, as you can see, you know, I put feed down in paper, 50 grams per chick, but there's nothing here. This pan doesn't have enough feed in it. This is about a two inch lip. And here we flooded the pan and here too. We have found that chicks are actually quite um, behavioral in their feeding ability. Some might only want to go to one feed pan. Some might be more adventurous and go to other ones. So there's behavior feeding. But what's wrong with providing consistency? All we have to do is rake this out in a consistent way, flood those pans, so they have availability of feed and access to feed. This is what's important. Feed lids, feed lids work great, but they have to be filled, right? I mean, here, I, there's not enough feed in the pans. This is in the breeder operation. We have our water trays down, et cetera, but I see some flaws here that we could maybe make some improvements on. But we're gonna feed them up, one, one lid per, per 100 chicks, and have them flood onto the paper. And why not put some uh, feed down on the paper? Provide that opportunity. That's what's important as they seek um, for feed and water. So as each day progresses, Assess how your chicks are doing, right? And respond, not react. If we have to react, then it's too late. 
each and every day is a good day. These birds are growing 24 seven. At the back end, they're growing five grams an hour. There's no room for air. And in the chicks, as they try to thermoregulate, we are the mama chicken. We need to provide that feed and water in that comfort zone, right? And we have to make the modifications because the key word here is respond. If we have to react, then we might have to rely on therapeutics. And that's not the goal in good chick husbandry. We want to respond by, by observing the situation, what the challenges might be, and turn them into an opportunity, right? So review how your feed is placed and distributed and based it on chick behavior. This, this is my best tool, right? It's a five gallon bucket. I turn it upside down and I watch the bird's behavior. In dairy barns, it used to be a bale of hay, but five gallon buckets really work. This is transition, right? But even here, I can see some particle size that is much too large for chicks. Here, you know, is see the feeding uniformity. All are accessing around that feed pack. That's what we want to see. But here, it's not flooded. Chicks are going to be stressed. They're reaching over to try to access this feed. And some might just give up <clears throat> and they can't reach it and start eating litter. That's what we don't want. So manage of feed is incredible, right? It's availability. It's about accessibility. These are the important things when we get chicks into a barn. You need to sit on the five gallon bucket <clears throat> and you need to watch the behavior of the birds in that environment. Critical as we go forward. This is not feed, right? We're talking litter here. So how we manage the feeder, how long the feed is in the pan and how often and when we raise the feeders become important. So in the early brooding period, feed we need access to. The amount, 50 grams uh, per chick, or you know, feed lids, you know, 100 chicks to one feed lid, and where we put them. This is what's important, okay? Uh, brooding management, uh, people say, well, remove feeding paper three days onwards. No, I'm sorry, I question that. We don't have to remove the paper all the time. A lot of the paper we get and put down in that, in, in that period to put feed on can be actually um, degrade into the, into, into the litter as well. So again, define what type of paper you are putting down. And you say, we'll remove the paper three days onwards, <clears throat> maybe a little bit at a time, but you have to understand that transition period. Not every barn is different. In Canada, there's 2,500 broiler barns. And I'll guarantee there's 2,500 different ways of growing chicken or starting chicken. So that depends on the transition, of course, to our automation. Top up feed regularly during the first three to four days in feed lids, critical. Just because you put feed down in the lid and walk away doesn't mean you don't have to top it up. But again, focus on that transition. If they're not transitioning to the automation, then you're gonna have to fill those feed lids up more and then gradually take them out a percentage at a time. And should chicks be on the main feeding system six to seven days of age? Yes. Um, they really, um, you know, if we have the right ratios, um, they've made that transition well. They should be on the automation and do quite well. Feed management, again, that integrated approach. We need feeding space. We need, in, because insufficient feed, feeding space will reduce growth, cause poor uniformity. Um, <clears throat> and, and definitely incorrect feeding adjustment can increase spillage. And we spend a lot of money on feed. You know, that availability needs to be there for the growth and, and good feed conversion. And uneven feed distribution can result in poor performance, poor uniformity, increased competition for feeders. And that's what we don't want. We don't need cellulitis as they compete for feed, et cetera, and scratching over each other, et cetera. One thing that comes up, and I won't spend too much time, is feed farm. Um, we do know from our work that we have done at Avigen, and we have a lot of resource information, um, especially bulletins and technical data, that feed physical quality is quite, quite critical to the bird. And if you look at the first 10 days, we're looking for a mash or crumble of 1.5 to 3 millimeters in diameter. Chicks aren't made to handle pellets, okay? And they're not made to handle fine flower type feed. There's a certain size that they select, and that's why we emphasize the integrity of that feed, whether it be a crumble or a mash or a mini pellet, 
my goal is to try to understand what the bird perceives as the opportunity for consumption, and that is 1.5 to 3 millimeters in diameter. Too many fines, you get too much occupation, especially an older bird. Bird with too many fines, um, you're going to get birds crawling over each other, and I worry about skin scratches and condemnations. So when we do have good feed, we have better control. Birds have better access to the feed. And um, this work that was done in 2004 reveal that at the finer the particles, the less the weight. So we really try to strive with good presentation of feed, but the integrity of that crumble or mini pellet or mash is really important. They're not made to handle a whole kernel of corn or a whole kernel of wheat. Top dressing with whole wheat in the first few days is not, um, is definitely not for a neonate such as a chick. Now, L of flaws, light. Um, not a lot of detail in the first seven days. Um, what we do know that we have to have uniformity in light distribution. Um, intensity is becoming more and more important in our birds of uh, our broilers of today. We try to shoot for four foot candles. Some of our old incandescent bulbs were lucky to have 1.8 foot candle under the bulb and between the two the 10 foot centers we're lucky to have maybe one foot candle. So we're really really and truly we need to to go for um, duration, but also intensity. And we really want to have that four foot candles in the first seven to 10 days. Duration, um, we do know that as the bird gets older, we can drop the four, days, six, four to six hours of, uh, and give them rest. But I like to see in the first five to seven days, 23, one, 23 hours of light, one hour of darkness. But again, you need to manage the bird by taking its weight to see where it is on that growth curve that you might have to give it more rest. So again, that it becomes critical for making managerial changes to your light regime. Um, always check your animal welfare regulations. That's critical. Um, work on the nutritional package, of course. Uh, wavelength is now the question. I'm not gonna give a talk on, on um, red, blue, blue versus green and white lights. Uh, one thing that I've seen with some of the poor quality LED is, is flickering of lights and there needs to be more work done with respect to the stress that that might cause on our broilers today. So when we do our, our, our investigation of light, we definitely, I use a light meter, right? And this is the one that we use because we need to have a starting point. Um, I talked to a lot of growers and they said, well, we reduce the light by 40%. 40% of what, right? I need to know quanti quanti quantitatively what is the foot candles at chick level. And uh, here, as you can see, light meter is showing strong foot candles, strong intensity. So the birds are definitely in environment with um, good light and exposure. So full light, um, definitely day to one to day seven. I like to go at a 100% intensity and then the intensity is reduced over time to the final day of, of uh, processing. Of course, there's differences with the uh, age, with differences in, in the age of the dimmers, differences between dirty and old and dry bulb, dirty bulbs, we need to make sure they're clean, differences between type of bulbs, as I mentioned with incandescent, and differences uh, between the starting points, right? Um, that's for sure. So here, innovative way was they had a string of lights over the feed and water lines um, because the, the older type barn in this way here, they provided good light intensity and was uniform and consistent across that comfort zone or brooding chamber. Here, LED lightings, good consistent chamber, full house brooding. Uh, the intensity was good and we went for 23.1 of 23 hours of light, one hour of darkness, and provided a great opportunity for chick start. Same here, um, there could be a lot of shadows, et cetera, depending on the nature of the pen and what is involved or in the pen with beams and structures. But this is a good opportunity here with respect to intensity for the birds to seek uh, feed and, and water, right? Um, this is great for grandkids. Um, I always like to do this once in a while with the pointer of my thermo, the gun for registering temperature. Um, birds are quite inquisitive and, you know, chasing the dot, et cetera, or running away from the dot. 
gives me an opportunity to, to look at chick health. Air, the A of flaws, really critical. Um, no doubt when we look at air, um, we have to understand that our birds during the first seven to 10 days can thermoregulate. They're basically poikiothermic, right? Meaning they can't thermoregulate. We are the chicken mama. We need to provide that environment that is conducive for them to feel comfortable and seek water and feed, right? So we usually start with a litter temperature 31 to 34 degrees. Um, I like to use my thermometer, my brown thermometer to get an idea of what their temperature is. Um, the reason I do this is you can't take a picture, you know, do a temp on the wall and say the birds are comfortable. I like to actually pick up the chick and do vent temps. Um, you know, if you have grandchildren or children, you don't literally take the probe and take a temperature of the wall and say my child has a fever. No, you actually got to use the thermometer and find out whether or not the child has a fever. Um, chicks, um, I like to randomly go through the barn and look at vent temps. I want to make sure that their vent temps are registering 103 to 105 or 33 to 40 degrees 0.5 centigrade. That tells me that they're in a happy zone. They're in a thermal neutral zone, uh, which is their comfort zone, that they feel an opportunity to now look for feed and water. So again, I like to monitor the chick behavior for optimal environment and temperature. Um, as you know, if they're huddling, it tells me they're too cold and I don't like drafts. Um, the draft is unplanned uh, while proper ventilation is, is planned. And chicks in the first few days do not need a lot of ventilation. Ideal brooding temperature or brooding chamber for relative humidity, 55 to 70. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the presentation, but um, not always in, in some areas that we have relative humidity of 55 to 70 degrees. Critical, ammonia is low. Um, if you smell ammonia, then something has to be done about it. Carbon dioxide, I've been in barns where chicks are huddling lethargic. Um, these are box heaters that ventilate inside and I started to feel dizzy and I soon realized that I better get my carbon dioxide meter into the barn and sure enough, it was up over six, 7,000 PPM. So carbon dioxide is important. Um, we need to have it low. We can't stress our birds with high CO2. Minoxide is actually more lethal. This is something that we need to pay attention to because not only is it important for chick health, but also for worker health as well. Dust carries bacteria, dust carries viruses. It damages the respiratory tract. We really don't need dusty environments. And humidity, if it's too low, we need to look at an opportunity to get it up um, you know, to the 50 to 70 percent humidity and uh, if it is too high then we need to really correct and look at our ventilation procedures. Uh, temperature is definitely influenced by relative humidity right it's called dry bulb and um, we have areas in Canada where it's 15 percent relative humidity and there's no doubt in that situation we're going to have to up our brooding temperatures and it goes back to what chick behavior. We need to understand that relative and temperature relative humidity and temperature, they do interact, right? And if we have really high humidity levels, then we can reduce our brooding temperatures. And the red gives a good indication of what our, our, our focus should be. Now, these are all in the Ross Broder manuals. Uh, this manual is set up for global review. But again, I, I really, really promote getting into barns and sitting on the bucket and watching those birds. A lot of the manuals are on a global basis. You need to look at the manual, but you also need to look at the specifics. And that's why you have to have your fingers in the pulse. You need to manage by being around. You need to get into the barn, okay? So a lot of sensors, three feet or one meter above the ground, that's not at floor level. Um, I've never seen a three foot chick or a one meter tall chick. If we're using sensors that are inconsistently put across the barn in different areas, uh, we really need to focus on, on the chick uh, comfort, where the chicks are, right? I mean, you can see here that if it's reading 33 degrees up here, what is it reading down there? So again, we need to pay attention. Sensors that are showing 30 degrees up here at the floor level, bum liver, it could be, it could be a lot cooler. And that's why, you know, we are now looking at litter probes in some of our operations where we can go in and take a litter probe and put it on the floor. 
and where the chicks are, and you can cover it just with a bit of li little bit of litter, but it gives us an opportunity to understand at chick level what the temperatures are. And of course, I'm really keen on the back end as well, where I've seen some litter temperatures of 90 degrees or 32 degrees, and actually the, the sensors were set for 68 or 26 degrees down here. So we really need to focus on litter temperature, especially if we're talking in the first seven days, right? Uh, some researchers showed, and this was done by Dozier um, years ago, that in a 32 degree centigrade, uh, the body weight was 90 grams less, and the feed conversion was reduced, um, um, or was feed was 1.4. But when we have the temperature at 27 degrees centigrade, body weight was much less, and the feed conversion definitely slipped um, and went was a lot higher. Um, even here at 10 days, those weights are low. So, but the, the key word there is is trend, right? So impacts of chilling and overheating. If where chicks are cool, vent temps under 103 degrees or 39 degrees centigrade, they will have cold feet. And the old method was to pick up the chick and put the feet on your, on your uh, cheek. And that kind of gives you kind of a rough idea of how the chicks perceive the environment at the time. Uh, will they huddle near the heat source if they can find it? Yes, many do. Uh, use nutrients to warm themselves rather than to grow. And that's a waste of the feed and energy you're putting into the bird. Uh, short periods of cooling will cause long-term loss of growth, so we got to avoid chilling, um, as we see here. And cooling can result not only in low temperatures, but also from drafts. Um, sometimes I'll use a lighter, and if the flame flickers too much, that's telling me that um, there's a draft in the barn. we got to try to avoid drafts. It's very critical. Uh, hot, te hot chicks, bed temps usually exceed 105. And uh, as we know, pasted bums usually on chicks are caused by overheating, overheating, and overheating. Uh, temperatures that are too high will depress appetite, right? They will pant, um, reduce feed consumption, will have less seven day body weights. High vent temps can result in damage to the intestine. You know, the structure of intestine will deteriorate and will have leakage in it. And actually, the feces will actually change in their consistency. Uneven overheating will have a negative impact on flock uniformity and overheating can result from humidity, et cetera. So there is an optimum temperature, right? And that's what we had to, to try to, to look for. Um, in my travels, when we talk about heat sources, there's such things as coal burning pots, as we see here in some areas of our wonderful world. Um, we have wood stoves. We have our brooding chambers or, or pancake brooders. And as you can see here, the temperature under the brooder and where the zone of comfort might be. And then right now we have a lot of tube heaters, et cetera. Um, depending on the heat source, depending where you are globally, the heat source is there to try to provide a comfort zone. The key is to have and analyze where that comfort zone is. Um, in this pancake brooder here, let me go back. We want to make sure that we don't place our satellite feeders and drinkers right under the brooder. It can get up to 115, 125 degrees Fahrenheit there. We need to spread it out. What I like to do is when the brooder is on, I like to know exactly where it might be, say, 32 degrees or 90, 92 degrees Fahrenheit. And when they're off, I also like to make a mark where uh, the temperature might be 92 degrees Fahrenheit. It's in between those two areas. Feed when the heater's off and when the heater's on, between these two areas here is where I'd like to put my satellite feeders and drinkers. To me, that's the comfort zone. Um, you want to give that ability of the bird to move away from too much heat or move closer to the heat. Um, and that definitely is where you want your feed and water to be. Um, in a smaller situation, heat lamps feed and water is dispersed around in the comfort zone, birds have access to it. Um, typical in our observation is that when we see birds in a steady state, under the right environment, you'll have little pockets of activity. Some birds will rest, some birds will be eating, some birds will be drinking, some birds will be walking around searching. This is called steady state. 
In this situation here, environmental temperatures are appropriate. The birds perceive a comfort zone and the chicks can definitely find their feeding water and access it comfortably for what? For good immune function, for good growth, musculoskeletal integrity. In this situation, when it's too cold, birds are huddling. And when they huddle, they expend energy. They don't use the feet to grow. And a lot of the times when they huddle, they're usually on feed lids or under your brooders. They're trying to get away from that cold, and which is robbing you of your profits, right? And also causing stress and challenges to your chick. So here, what's the case here? Huddling under the brooder, um, it is too cold. And this situation when it's too hot, um, a lot of times I'll see birds individually panting, wings out, it's too hot. And whip box heaters, or if you have um, if you, heated floors, it could be really critical. I've found with water heated floors that if it is too hot and you turn it down, it takes a, quite a few hours for that temperature to drop to provide that optimal environment for the bird to feel comfortable. So again, behavior is critical. Watch the behavior of the bird. Um, you can put temperatures here at the chick level. Um, I have used and touched the feet to my face to get an idea of how the birds perceive the environment that they're in contact with. Again, we can use our thermometers this way, but again, the brawn thermometer, depending on when you are, is a wonderful tool. And again, that tells me what the bird is perceiving and how they are trying to, to judge the environmental temperature for their comfort in order to go out and seek feed and water. Okay, our goal again, um, 39 to 40.8 or 45, 40.5 degrees centigrade, and that temperature gives us the opportunity to see where that bird sits um, for our managerial input. The optimum performance zone, this is where the birds are eating and drinking, the amount of energy, et cetera, that's consumed is for growth. The birds are too hot. What's going to happen is they're going to be panting. There's going to be increased heat stress, and um, we are not going to have that growth. There's going to be a lot of feed that is going to be lost to trying to have that bird in a comfort area, i.e. it's going to be panting. And here they're going to be huddling trying to keep warm. And um, again, our feed is not appropriate for the growth of the bird. We want to make sure that we have that comfort zone where the birds are going to use the nutrients to develop. And this is critical for the bird for, for performance. Water, essential, yes, absolutely. Probably one of the most essential things we can do for our birds on farm, whether it be a chick and or as in a growing or finishing period, but water is really critical. We want to make sure that we start clean. We want to have fresh water, uh, warm, but not too warm. We don't want it too cold. I've found a lot of times in Canada, when we flush too soon before the chicks arrive, the, the water can be quite chilly. And if you want to chill a chick, chill it from the inside out. Cold water is not the way to go. We want to make sure it's at appropriate temperature, that the birds feel comfortable drinking it and not expend a lot of energy to try to keep it, try to keep warm because of the coldness of the water during consumption, right? I always talk about the principle that if I go into a chick barn, um, brooding especially, and I have a cup, and if I take the nipple off and I fill up that cup with water, would you drink it? And if you would not drink it, then you really got to question the health of that water, right? Is there any microbes that you're concerned about? or anything of that nature. So again, feel comfortable that what the chicks are drinking is what you would possibly drink yourself. It has to be available. And of course, pH, we don't want it too acidic or too basic. Rule of thumb for starting birds, of course. Um, and then our nipple drinkers, we want if a bigger bird, 12 birds per nipple. And then of course, in, um, or sorry, bigger birds, nine birds per nipple, and then in our smaller bird category, 12 birds. But in a brooding chamber, if we're focus house brooding, we can probably get away with 25 to 30 chicks per nipple until we uh, you know, pull up the brooding guards and the birds then go into the whole house area of the barn. And now we get into the ratios that are conducive for growth. 
bell, bell drinkers, 10 drinkers per thousand birds. Uh, chicks per nipple, again, I want to reemphasize that if you have partial house brooding, um, you can go up to 25 to 30 chicks per nipple, but please not 50, right? It creates a stress. We don't want that. But once the birds feel comfortable in the brooding chamber, um, maybe we're having a brooder chamber for coccycycline and we'll feel comfortable that the litter moisture is good for sporulation and recycling of the oocyst. We can take out the brooding guards and then as the birds go across the barn, then we're getting into the barn inventory of 12 or 9 birds per nipple. Water should be available 12 hours a day. Water restriction is not acceptable. Uh, drinker height daily. First three days, and I'll show you pictures, I want that nipple line, that droplet, right at eye level. I don't want it too high. I don't want it too low. I want that chick to see at eye level where that nipple is, especially that water droplet, right? Uh, monitor water, as we know, depending on temperature, possibly feed, the ratio of water to feed is 1.8 to 1. If birds don't drink, they don't eat, okay? Not if they don't eat, they don't drink. If they don't drink, they don't eat. We have to have availability of water. It is absolutely critical. Ideal temperatures, uh, possibly later on 59 to 70, maybe they can handle a cooler, but I don't want it too hot. I don't want water that is hot enough to make tea from. And I don't want water that is so cold I don't need ice. There has to be a range in starting day old chicks where the water is conducive, a range that is conducive for palatability, not so much with respect to taste, but comfort in drinking it. I don't want it too cold. Again, we will chill the chicks, right? So be careful and, 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 and when we do supply water that we're providing that temperature that is conducive for chick health, chick growth, and chick comfort, okay? Brooding, again, um, I talked about, uh, we need to make sure that the birds feel comfortable with that water, not only quality, but also temperatures. Okay, and water restriction, we do not want to see. Um, lines are too high, they're not gonna reach the, the droplet of water. Um, if we don't have the right ratios, we could have water restriction. We don't want that. If we have a reduction in water, water availability, we're gonna have a reduction in feed intake, which will affect our performance. And here, this paper that was given by Riverio, um, no doubt, I think the key there is the trends, right? Uh, let's not look at the absolute numbers, but we do know that if we restrict water, feed consumption will go down. And if feed consumption goes down, our weight, weight, weight gain goes down. Our feed conversions um, are somewhat not significantly different here, but they were probably not adjusted to body weight, right? Intestinal weight, which is the manufacturing facility of a bird during those early stages, look at the weight of the intestine when we strict water. It dramatically goes down. And of course, the villi height or the cells of the intestine, which generate the opportunity for feed assimilation and absorption, that is reduced as well. So for all stages, water availability is critical, right? Um, our flow and pressure needs to be reviewed. I do not want to see 60 mLs per minute in a day-old chick. I do not want to see 5 mLs per minute in a day-old chick. I have found too many times where the pressure is far too high in the nipple line that the birds are wet on their breast here. And that tells me that I really need to review the pressure and the amount of mLs per minute on that line. And if you have six lines in the barn, I really, I just say, encourage you to look at each and every line. You want consistent water pressure for each of those lines. Whether you have three water lines or four or five or six or seven, depending on the width of your bar, what is the variance? I've been in barns where I've had water lines of 60 mLs per minute and some down as low as five. That's not good for uniformity. That's not consistent. And all it requires is data by measuring the amount of water and making the necessary pressure changes at the regulator and height. I don't want one water line where the birds have to jump up and down to try to reach the nipple or duck, duck under the water line. I want those water lines, especially the water droplet on the nipple to be at eye height. All six, three, four, five, six water lines, you have to have consistency in presentation and flow 
and they have to be able to access it and clean up the leaks. I, I can't handle uh, wet spots under water lines. Fix the water line, fix the nipple. This encourages bacterial growth, coccycycline, et cetera. We need consistency in the brooding chamber. We can't have variance. And so water quality, water quantity and availability, this is not acceptable. This is a way of promoting Pseudomonas and E. coli and bacteria. And this came from a friend in Alberta, but this is what could happen. I've seen Pseudomonas, I've seen E. coli. And when we look at waterline sanitation, it is critical. And there's availability, oxidation reduction potential, right? Acidity and, and with respect to chlorination. I mean, microbes are a serious issue in our barns today, whether it be E. coli, salmonella, et cetera. We have to have reduction. We can't have biofilm buildup in our water lines or even in our belt bounds depending on what you're using in your brooding chambers. They have to be clean. Bacteria is a serious issue. We need to respond to these challenges. And if we have to react, it's too late. We need to be on top of things. We, again, I keep using that. We have to have our fingers in the pulse. We have to have our MBA degree managed by being around. And not only is quantity critical, but the quality of the water is more critical. So we need to pay attention. When you have a dirty bell fount with bacterial growth or, or, or et cetera, you, it, it could be Pseudomonas, could be E. coli, could be Pasteurella, and they have to be clean. So I really, really stress water line sanitation and height, temperature, volume. When you're looking at day old chick, sit on your five gallon bucket, right? And see where that water line droplet is, that nipple droplet is, has to be at eye height. It has to be. The temperature has to be conducive for accent, for, for comfort. And I don't want cold water. I don't want hot water. The volume has to be there and consistent across the barn. And if you have to flush, then flush. But try to flush maybe during the dark period. Because in some areas, when you flush water lines, the water can come in quite cold. Right? So we have simple, simple gauges that we use and I can use in barns to judge how many mLs per, per, per nipple on the water lines. Too high, right? And this is too low. We need to make sure that we have a consistent approach to cost of wine. These cups are fine, but I've seen too many times in barns where the cups were filthy, and we can't have that. Rule of thumb, depending on which um, water equipment company you go with, is I go week of age times you know, seven plus 20. So usually in the first week, um, seven, uh, seven, 20, 21, and 20, 27 mLs, or after three weeks of age, 41 mLs. But again, you need to check consistently through your operation, what is the water flow available? What is the availability of, wa of water through those lines? And I like to check at placement three weeks and six weeks and keep that data and trigger the water lines. What we did here is we used a clean room and I triggered all the water lines. You can see where the water droplet is. The water droplet is, is revealed at the end of the nipple and when we lower them down with that light intensity, it's quite magnetic, right? And again, I, I really emphasize 20 to 30 mLs per minute. There's a lot of information on water quality availability. Avigen has a huge resource of technical information on the website that you can go to. But it's really critical. I mean, there is, again, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. We can't just inspect. We really need to get the data, create the dialogue and discussion, and hopefully not the discipline. But um, we just, we need to monitor the birds 24-7. We just can't run off of SOPs or standard operation procedures or protocols that we've used in the past. Each and every flock is different. I've seen where I've gone into barns and the chicks are jumping up and down to try to reach the, the, the water droplet. Um, the operator comes in with a five gallon bucket, picks up the mortality, goes to each water line and raises them another two, another two centimeters. Why? Well, it's part of their protocol. Well, their protocol is not conducive for chick health. They didn't sit on a five gallon bucket and watch the behavior of the birds that revealed that the water lines were already too high. 
Maybe some of the mortality was from dehydration. Maybe we need to spend more time on the five gallon bucket. What I like to do is have two hats. One hat I put on is pick up dead bird hat and, and do the pathology and or postmortems if needed. And the other one is my management hat. When I put on the management hat, I focus on the flaws. I sit on a five gallon bucket, I watch the behavior of the birds because they will tell you what you want. They will tell you what they need. And their behavior is very important in our management um, process as we, as we go forward, okay? Our broiler chick start aims, quite simple. We need to manage that transformation from the embryo to the chick, of course, but we also have to manage that process that the chicks are fed as quickly as possible after hatch, right? Once on the farm, all the chicks should find food and water quickly. That's all about establishing a comfort zone. You are the mama chick. You are the incubator in that first seven days that is important for them to be established. You have to pay attention to it. They imprint on you. You need to provide that environment that is conducive for their vitality. It's really important. What you lose in the first seven days, you will not get it back. Serious. Consistent early growth in uniformity as a good start basis for good final weights in uniformity is important. Right? There has to be an appetite and that helps to develop. Now, I want to get into in, uh, in my last part of the presentation a few more slides. Again, take this home. You cannot manage what you don't measure. I'm not saying that you need Michael Schumacher's uh, Mercedes Benz where everything is here. Okay? You don't manage from the anti room or the non chick room off of your computers. You got to be in the barn. You got to use your stockmanship, your sight, your taste, your touch, your smell, your hearing. If you smell ammonia, it's too late. You need to do something about it. If birds are huddled, you need to use that God-given right to observe what's going on and make changes. If you hear no chirping at all, is that normal? If you hear screeching and loud noise, is that normal? You need to do something about it. This is called management. It's perceiving the environment with your flock sense and making the managerial changes. This is important, okay? And how do I assess chick flock? You know, these reports are important. Create a data, create a log, a daily log. Communicate with the feed mill, communicate with the hatchery. When you walk through the flock, what does the uniformity look like? Is there sick birds? Is there incidents of defects or injuries? How does it smell? And communicate to the hatchery. That's what's important, okay? Pattern on the floor, are they bunched, crowded? Against the wall, are they spread out, over, you know, accessing feed and water? You know, this is important. And again, are the chicks sluggish? Is there too much CO2? Are they hyperactive, can't find water? Are they loud and, and noisy or are they quiet? Are they sneezy, right? And I've seen too often and this was taken from a shearing technical um, article, I think Lene Newman wrote it years ago, and it is a valuable piece of information. But if this mortality starts at day three, four, five, six, you're going to blame the hatchery? Especially if you open up the birds and they're all dehydrated. Are you going to blame the hatchery? So when I hear a seven day mortality of six or 10%, I don't get too excited until I see the pattern of mortality. Okay, when did they start dying? Did you have high DOAs, day one, day two, day three mortality? Or did mortality start at day three, four, five, six, seven? This is critical. It's not just the percentage of mortality of seven days, it's the pattern of mortality. And understand what is happening at chick level. I'm, I'm almost 195 meters, six foot four. I'm on the floor. I wanna get at the chick level. I wanna see what the chicks are perceiving at that nipple height. I want to know if there's access to feed. And the only way to do that is to get on the floor at their level. And usually what I'll do is, if, you know, I don't have my wedding ring on because I'm doing a lot of work outside and um, I have it here. But when my wedding ring is on, if those chicks come over and start pecking that, at the ring, that tells me that's what? That's good behavior. And that's all in this video, okay? Crop fill, the most, when I gave talks in Africa, no doubt, it's the best tool that they can use to evaluate the first 10 days is crop fill. If birds aren't in a comfort zone accessing feed and water, what do you think their crop fill would be? It's going to be very low. 
And if there's no feed in the crop, there's no gut movement, there's no yolk sac absorption, the birds get um, poor doing, and they die. So Cropville is a tool that doesn't cost any money, just time. And I will go into a barn, whether it be 50, 60 feet by 600 feet, and I'll take different areas and I'll sit down maybe six or eight different parts of the barn. I will pick up birds and I'll do chick temps, crop fill, and, and observe and, and how they are in their environment, right? And crop fill to me is critical. Look, look at that crop here. That is just a pouch of opportunity, right? And I shoot for 100%. Sorry, I'm not gonna lowball. I'd rather tame a, tame a tiger than push a turtle. I'm going through for 100%. But even at two hours, I can still start feeling crop fill. And crop fill is, to me, is critical. It's critical. And I've seen times where not only is the quantity of crop fill, but also the quality, right? If I have a full soft and rounded crop, that means they found feeding water. And that's in the technical bulletins for the wonderful opportunity at avigen.com to find more information on, on to evaluate crop fill. If it's hard, and the size of a pea and heart, what's that telling you? They're not on water. So not only is crop fill critical in judging what percentage are in the comfort zone, finding feed and water, but also the texture. I've also picked up birds and the texture of the crop would felt like litter. And what is that telling you? The birds are not happy. They're not in the comfort zone. They're sitting eating litter. And I've opened them up too, and they full of darkling bees. So again, if you do have chicks, open them up and find out exactly what they're consuming. That will help too. This is a happy crop fill, right? And we do know that if the temperature is ideal, our percentage of crop fill goes up. If temperature is not there, meaning comfort zone, they're not feeding water, what happens to our percent crop fill? It goes down. Crop fill is one of the best tools that you can use. This guy's crop was so big he had to lean it on the feed lid because it was too heavy. Only joking. But look at this one. No crop fill dehydrated, poor doing, starve up, no doubt, right? Weigh chicks. Weighing chicks can help. It gives us an opportunity. We do know that early feed intake on seven body, seven day body weight is significant. Each one of those dots is a chick. And when birds get on the feed and consume feed and the more feed they consume, the better the body weights. Why? Because the birds at seven days, 10 grams imp improvement at 10 days, it equate to almost 70 grams at the back end. And never mind four times body weight. If you got a chick that's placed at 40 grams, we used to shoot for 160. I've seen weights of up to 230 grams at seven days. But to me, that's almost pushing it too much. I like to go around 190, 195 grams, almost 4.4, 4.5 body weight at day and age. And this is important because it's important for the bird. And again, you know, this is from a friend of mine in Ontario, great. I mean, chick, chick, they're using cameras more and more now, remote video auditing. And this was 10 years ago. This is chick placement. And then you start to see them spread out. Day 14, I believe. Day 21, day 28, and time of processing. Birds, we need to have our fingers in the pulse. We need to be monitoring 24 seven, right? And we can't be in the barn 24 seven. That's why I believe in precision livestock farming going forward, whether it be thermography, whether it be robotics, whether it be remote video auditing, which is important, but also we need to walk the barn. We need our MBA degree. We need, need to manage by being around, no doubt, right? So lots of information. Avigen has a wonderful poster called the first 24 hours also evaluating brooding temperature, et cetera. So there's no excuse. There's information out there, but you gotta get in your barn. And when you place chicks at day of age, it's not the time to go out and see or fix something. It's time to spend in the barn. Because what you lose in the first seven days, you will not get it back. These are neonates, they can thermoregulate, they need attention to the flaws. Food, lighting, air, and water, okay? And space or sanitation, security, et cetera. This is our opportunity. There's checkoff lists. Uh, we have checkoff lists that our technical team uses in the field, and that will be on the web, or if you need such, um, don't hesitate to contact us. But everything I talked about is on that checkoff list. And again, detailing what you do in that barn, what the chicks encounter in the first seven days, it's absolutely critical. 
Yes, I did write a book. Uh, and the reason I did is because a lot of backyard farmers I thought weren't doing the job that was appropriate. Um, every chick that is placed, whether it be three or 30 or 30,000 or 300,000, need, needs a fresh start. So I thought and I, there was a need for me to write a book and I wrote a book called Raising Amazing Chicks and it could be purchased on Amazon. But again, this is not about purchasing a book, it's about paying attention to detail, right? And I just wanna shout out um, to the World Poultry Foundation, um, working with that team in uh, efforts in feeding Africa, rural Africa, and that is important as well. Okay, so I'm both done, Keith. Uh, I am done, there's a black screen <laughs> as we see now. But I'm um, sorry it took so long. It's already 12.15. I went on for an hour and 15 minutes. But if you have any questions. Um, a lot of great information there. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, um, can you unshare your screen and we'll get to some um, questions here. A lot of, a lot of good questions. Stop here. Saddle, saddle up. Saddle up. We got some good questions. <laughs> um, first of all, um, kind of sorting through some of these. Um, you talked to, there's a couple of different questions and, and just kind of get you to review um, the humidity recommendations you have at placement. Um, one question was like, um, how do we get relative, what do we do if relative humidity, humidity 60 to 70%? What if we can't get it to 40%? I mean, what are your recommendations? Again, I know you mentioned it there, then what are options to do if it's too high or too low? Well, to me, we'll talk about low humidity. Uh, when I see humidity of 15 to 20%, um, especially in barns that might have heaters that ventilate outside or use water heaters, it's hard to get it up. It's hard to get that humidity up until the birds start to become active, eat and drink and defecate on the floor. Some will go in and actually use sprayers, backpack sprayers to wet the walls and, and the floor to try to bring the humidity up, um, especially in RWA programs where they're using a lot of coccidiosis vaccines. Um, it's important to have 30% litter humidity or, or moisture in order to have that sporulation and recycling. But it's a challenge. The key is when we have low humidity is to make sure our brooding temperatures are higher. Higher humidity, okay. lower brooding temperatures, lower humidity, higher brooding temperatures. And again, uh, there's no rule, okay? The, the, the discipline is an observation. So when the humidity is low, you can go in with sprayers and, and et cetera, and you know, walls and the litter. Um, but you're only going to get that surface until we can get the birds actively moving defecating and the humidity goes up. Now, a lot of these, some barns we have like tube heaters, uh, propane and, and uh, gas. Um, I forget, I'm not an engineer. Um, you know, Michael's team probably more, no more in Georgia, but a propane of, of gas burnt, um, it was about 700 liters or mLs of water. So if they ventilate inside, that'll bring up the moisture as well, but then they worry about the gases, CO2 and carbon monoxide. When the humidity is too high, uh, a, I worry about wet litter, especially if we're putting feed down in paper. I don't want feed put placed too early and go moldy. I've seen when feed is put down in paper on, on damp litter or high humidity, the feed will go moldy. And that's not good for growth rate as, as well. If you have high humidity, then again, you meet, you meet probably, and I'm not an engineer in ventilation, but you need to get a variable fan going and try to drop that humidity. Because I find if humidity gets over 70%, it's really hard to get it back it's really hard to get it back. And that's why I think when we get to humidities of 60, 65, we need to start looking at ventilation as an opportunity to keep yep. it at, at a steady state. So you wouldn't necessarily recommend so much, um, like you're talking about if they're low humidity, you can raise the temperature a little bit. If it's higher humidity, you wouldn't really want to lower the temperature much, would you? Because you still, you want to dry it out, right? Yeah, you yeah you want to, you want to dry it out, but um, you know, you. The litter itself, but if you have wet litter, if you're talking about drying out the barn or drying out the wet litter, then that that needs to be regulated before the chicks even come right. onto the farm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what are your the main problems if somebody's got bacterial infection at day three on the farm? They're really seeing it by day three. Where, what are you looking at as far as probable causes? Again, good question. Really good question. I you know I've I've knew the answer to that. I I probably could do, <laughs> be a millionaire. You could write um, another book. Huh? <laughs> I could write another book, but again, it's the pattern of mortality. I've yep. seen where we've had great placements, Keith. Um, you know, the DOAs are dead on arrival, are very minimal. 
day one, day two, the birds are doing really well. And then you open them up and then you find a lot of bacterial insult, et cetera. Well, that's three days post-placement. Some of these birds could be on the road, you know, especially in the parent stock for up to 24 hours, right? So that's post-placement. First thing I want to do is look at water quality. Keith, I want to get into their, their water lines and, and swab the water lines to make sure that they're not exposed to E. coli or Pseudomonas. So doing postmortem in those birds become critical to find out what the bacterial insult might be, uh, umphalitis or yolk sac, or if it hasn't gone systemic at that age. Um, you know, you can talk to the hatchery to see if there has been any insult on the truck, not per se in the hatchery. If it's in the hatchery, I want to ask questions. If we believe it, I might source from the hatchery, then I would ask the hatchery, what are your, what are your calls? What are your rots? You know, what are you seeing on those forest locks, age of breeders? But when I see high mortality day three, I definitely want to go back through the process of the flaws. I want to know what might be challenging those chicks. I've seen a lot of times with medicators where the filter hasn't been changed or the water lines haven't been properly disinfected. That, bio, that biofilm on those water lines could harbor a lot of bacteria. And Susan has done a lot of work on that too with respect to Pseudomonas and E. coli. That first drink that chick can get could be a pocket full of bacteria. And that's why, you know, I always kind of old fashioned that way is get a cup, open up a nipple line, take the water, would you drink it? And if you won't drink it, then I question why you won't drink it. It's the same with cleaning of barns. If I go in a barn after it's being properly disinfected, they did a fantastic job on eating a donut. I drop it on the floor, would I pick it up and eat it? Yeah, of course my grandchildren is called the five second principle, but <laughs> but again, yeah. you know, these are these are just common principles that we need to consider. So it's day three mortality, I want to know the pattern of mortality. And if it is at day three, then we need to call effectively. And then we still need to pay attention to the other 97% people. Because if I have 3% mortality, I got 90% that are healthy. And if we don't pay attention to the food, lighting, air, water, space, and sanitation, then we're going to have this lingering mortality all the way to the end of grow out. And I've seen that too often. So we got to nip it quickly. We got to open the birds, address whether it's bacterial or not dehydration, because 3% mortality, it's like, and I'll go off a little bit, okay, Keith? I get questions. I got all these leg challenges. Okay, so, well, I got 10%, you know, 5% leg issues. Okay. Is it infectious or non infectious? Well, what do you mean? Is it infectious or non infectious? Is it metabolic or is it due to a, a bacteria or a virus? Right? So we need to bring it down. We need to focus. We need to target. We need to understand and ask the questions, and the data does help. So 3% mortality, I want to know why. Is it bacterial or dehydration? I want to know the pattern of mortality. How are the due ways? Communicate with the hatchery. How are the other source flocks? How are the other placements that day? Right? Then I ask, what was your chick temps at day of age? Oh, I don't know. What is the water flow? Mm, variable. So this is critical, and I'm not trying to be facetious or, or be funny, but these chicks are growing five, these birds are growing five grams an hour. There's no room for error, and that's why data becomes critical for proper discussion, dialogue, and then possibly discipline. So day three mortality, if it starts there and lingers to day six or seven, then I really want to look at all areas, key, and I need data. And data that's, that's usable, like, you know, what percentage, not just saying we have some or we have this number of chicks that are affected, well, what percentage of, is that of the flock? I mean, that's usable data. A number is not usable if we don't know the initial number and placement, get a percent, so. Oh, you hatchery, I mean, look at your expertise and yeah. the company that you have. I mean, you got 2% two, two calls. Wouldn't you like to know what, of that 2%, what were the calls? Yeah. Were they defects? Right. Streaky navels, right? Or red hawks? I mean, you need yep. to know that. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, what's, what's your opinion on uh, providing supplements such as probiotics at placement on the farm? Well, I mean, when I was with a company called Bear years ago, we had a product called Avagard, and I was doing trials of providing probiotics in the hatchery. I wanted to, when those birds were picking out, they were picking into that probiotic environment. I take probiotics myself. I believe in probiotics. Um, I want to get them into the bird as soon as possible. It would be great to see if it could be done in the hatchery or in the process, but on the farm, I would definitely start with probiotics, right? 
And some could be given in feed, some could be given in water, et cetera. Depending on the probiotic, whether it be defined or undefined, might have to be given continuously. Or if it's given a day of age, maybe you have replication, et cetera. So I mean, again, it depends on the product. But I believe in probiotics. I like the word pro. It's not antibiotics, it's probiotics. Yeah. And I want to make sure that when the probiotic is administered at the chick at arrival, not three days later, at arrival, that is getting that dose of a defined probiotic, you know, back, like whatever lactobacillus or bifidobacterium, whatever, whatever product is available, because I want to seed the gut with something predictable. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have something predictable, like a good probiotic, then we could be left under stressful situations with unwanted bacteria, such as E. coli or salmonella. So I believe in probiotics. Yeah. Yep, I agree with that. Pro part is a good thing. Yeah, pro is, is to me, is an, I take it every morning, right? And I believe in gut health, and as part of gut health, it's really critical. And it's called Nermi's Principle, competitive exclusion. I want to see that gut wall. My grandfather in the 40s used to feed fermented milk from his dairy herd to the chickens. No one told him about probiotics, but fermented milk had a lot of essential lactobacillus and those species that he, he observed that chickens did better, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer in it. Now, the, the other question is, should the birds start on vitamin, mineral mix and everything? I'm not a big believer in that. I'm a believer in probiotics. But when the chicks arrive from a hatchery that's paid attention to the yields and, you know, vent temps and evaporates that you talk about and you emphasize, and Aline did a great job. Those are chicks arrive in the farm with good water, good feed, good environment, and good nutrition. Everything is there, Keith. And, you know, and then the, then the yolk sac that's absorbed through peristaltic motion from the initiation of feed consumption provides a maternal antibody and some maybe other nutrients, but we don't need to jump into a vitamin mineral a day of age, right? I mean, but probiotics, I do believe in, yes. Okay. Um, kind of a, kind of a two-part question, you, since we're talking about probiotics and, and gut health and everything. So when, when does that gut really start to work to, to start, util, I mean, not just digest, but really utilizing the feed it's taken in? Then also you, you mentioned about the yolk. Um, how long can the chick get nourishment from that yolk following well, that? You know, the old days, they said bird, a bird can go without feed and water for three days because it has a yolk sac. Well, how does it get the yolk from the yolk sac if it's not on feed, right? So I believe that it's, it's no different than a child. They get, if their gut isn't working from the day of hatch onwards, they're not gonna live. And the way to stimulate that is get them on feed. So the gut itself, and you saw those pictures, when they get on the feed, that gut is almost three times the size. The gut works immediately. Villus and crip ratio start to form. That surface area starts to expand. It assimilates feed more. So getting them on the feed and water in that comfort zone, immediately the gut is working. The gut has to work immediately once they get on feed. If it doesn't, they will die. So to say that there's going to be a three or four days before the gut works is not true. They need to work immediately. And, and I'm not a physiologist, et cetera. We have some people internally that we look at gut integrity as part of our, our, our opportunities for genetics and selection. But gut integrity is critical. And it starts at day of age and rival on the farm immunocompetence, natural immunity, local immunity, villus crip ratio. That absorption of feed and simulation of feed occurs immediately. It starts to develop. And to develop it, you need to get them on a feed and water. The yolk will be utilized. But if you have to rely on the yolk only, then we're going to be in challenge. This is not jungle fowl. These are hard performing birds today. As I said, they're growing five grams an hour. Right? We need to get them on the feed and water. The yolk sac simply is not enough. Yeah, so, so the, the yolk sac, they can, particu tic particularly talking about our wildfowl, the, it's there, they can survive on that for up to 72 hours. But as soon as those birds hit the farm, we need them on food and water to get the process going. Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, they can, they can utilize that. And that helps us when we're shipping chicks. You know, one of the other follow-up questions were, okay, so if we're shipping chicks long distance from the hatchery, you know, do, do we need to provide drinking water? How do we handle that? Because it, with this in mind, I mean, do we just wait 24 hours before they get on the farm to 
to really get them going? Or I mean, so how do you deal with the long distance travel? We know as soon as they get the farm, we need food. What if it's going to take 24 hours to get there? Oh, we got chick placements that are 50 hours after. Yeah. Hatch. And we give supplemental pucks, supplemental um, feet. We're not only in the box a day of age or sorry, at, at departure, but also halfway through the voyage. We will stop the truck and then put additional supplements into the boxes, right? Because it's hydration. You know, we, we want to make, we don't, we, don't, we don't throw in whole grain. I mean, those nutritional supplements should be water. Water is critical. Mm -hmm. You can survive without feed, but water you can't. So water, those supplements that we give, those hydro, uh, you know, is, is water. Water is critical. They're like a, a lot of the supplement, the best part of them is a rehydration. For rehydration. Or staying hydrated is, is trying to prevent yeah. that dehydration. And that's why humidity too is critical on a truck transportation humidity is really low you'll dehydrate the chicks even more so we pay attention to temperature and humidity on the truck for chick health as well right and they're meant to run full just like a hatchery is meant to run full i mean you pay attention to what you know probably temperature humidity and co2 right i mean especially single stage those are critical mm -hmm. and um so i mean if you you know with the chick and it's um it's the same. So we supplementation in that situation is important. Um, okay. So if we've got a hatchery manager and or not a hatchery manager, somebody at the farm, and they they receive chicks um, day one, and they notice that they've got a high incidence of dehydration in those chicks on day one. Um, I mean, what happens if they get to feed too quickly and they're already a little bit dehydrated? How do you manage that from a hatchery? If you know, or from a, at a farm, if you know you got some dehydration issues, are you going to push water before feed or just at the same time? How do you manage that? It's a good question. I mean, without being on the farm, then I have, then, then I, I cannot tell you if they're dehydrated or not. But the question is already telling me that the person who's involved probably observed the chicks and handled the chicks. So if I get chicks that arrive in my farm that are noticeably smaller, scaly legged, depressed, sluggish, need of water from dehydration, I would definitely put them on water first. As I mentioned in my talk, if a bird comes in healthy, a chick comes in healthy, you know, gregarious, uh, inquisitive, give them the opportunity to make a choice, but absolutely, especially when I see with, you know, backyard flocks. If a chick arrives from the hatchery and doesn't arrive healthy, the first thing they need to do is to dip the beaks of the chick into a bell funk to get them on water. It's critical. Now, in a larger bird operation, I'm not going to pick up 30,000 chicks to bring them to each nipple line. But if I feel, based on my observation, based on my flock sense, that these chicks are dehydrated, of course I'm going to get them onto water. There's no doubt I'm going to lower the water lines. I'm going to create that comfort zone. I'm going to have to maybe put out some satellite drinkers. You know, parent stock with these long distances and travel, they should all be on satellite drinkers, supplemental drinkers besides just a nipple. Broilers, it's more difficult. And usually with broilers, they're on farm within certain hours, period of time. And if the barn is conducive, the proper lighting, especially intensity, and that droplet is glistening, they will go to it. They're very inquisitive. But if, but again, Keith, the person who asked that question has already perceived that the chicks were dehydrated. Of course, I'm not going to give them feed. If the birds are dehydrated and sluggish and showing, you know, scaly legs and, and uh, poor doing, et cetera, and you could tell, get them on water. Do yeah. the best you can. Yeah, but I, I, you know, like you said, if you've got 30,000 chicks in a barn, it's a little bit harder to do that. But I've seen that in smaller situations, people got chicks in shipped in and uh, they were dehydrated and then the chicks hit the feed immediately. And all of a sudden you had these crops packed full, almost hard as a, it was almost like a marble in there because they hadn't hit the water. And then you've got another issue. So then it's like, okay, in that situation, get on that water. You got to get that feed's not going to move until you get on water. Or bell founts with too much water or water trays with too much water, they drown in it. They literally go into the water and, and drown in it, right? And then they can get chilled, et cetera. So again, use your flock sense. If you feel the chicks are arriving dehydrated, it makes absolute sense to get them on the water first thing. Yep. And not yep. the feet. They'll choke out. Abs like I said in that presentation, 
I've seen crops where you have a hard as a pea, you know, in the crop. And then I look and the water lines, are, the nipples are too high. So they've gone to feed, but there's no water to assimilate with the feed to create that porridge-like consistency in the crop. And then what happens, right? Yeah, uh, they can't utilize it, yeah. Okay, well, talking about water, um, you know, you, I know you followed Susan Watkins a bit, a former colleague of mine. Um, so what would recommended pH of that water be starting off? Is it as critical starting off the pH of the water? We know it is in the grow out phase once they get beyond that. What about starting out? Is there a preferred level you'd like to see? I, you know, five and a half to six, six and a half around that, that area. I mean, Susan has those little answers written a lot of articles. Yeah. I don't want it too harsh, too active, meaning too acidic. And I don't want it too basic. But, um, you know, pH down to three and a half or four because they want to affect the chlorination. I think the water could be too active in that situation. So five, five and a half, it would be five and a half, six, six and a half around there. Okay. Here's a good, here's a good question. They specifically identify um, the Ross line. So right up your alley here. Yeah. Um, question was is that they have chickens they have they have received chicks that seem to need a temperature above what what is recommended i mean just by their behavior i'm assuming it by their behavior and so they have to raise that temperature setting to get the behavior right would you think that might be due to high temperature the incubation period that that caused them or low temperature do you think that's an incubation type of issue if initially they seem to need a high higher than what we normally would recommend? No, uh, there's a lot of variables in there. Um, if the chicks are pulled and are panting, and um, then it's almost too late, then you're gonna have a lot of pasted bums. You know, as Steve, a good, you know, Steve says, you know, three causes of pasted bums are overheating, overheating, overheating. So, um, to increase the temperatures, again, I want to know what the humidity is. Um, and I've seen where they'll go from 92 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, I don't have Celsius, and go to 93, 94, 95, and watch the bird behavior, and then they start moving around, etc. And that tells me they're searching, they're more comfortable, and they're looking for feed and water. Um, overheating on the truck, again, Keith, I go back to this, right? You use this a lot in the hatchery, do you not? Yep. You use it for egg temps, you use it for vent temps, chick pull. Um, I've seen where chicks are standing in front of the pool and left there where everyone goes in a break and their little heads are sticking out of the baskets panting. I'll guarantee their temperatures are over 105. And then when they come off the truck, are they panting? So again, I mean, where does overheat, if you think it's overheating, where does it initiate from? So I'll do it off, chicks off the back of the truck. And then I'll do it, you know, four or five hours later. Uh, because I want data in order to make proper suggestions and where corrective actions might be taken might need to take place. So you, so wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily immediately point to something in the hatchery that's causing them to, uh, or in the incubation period that's causing them to need a little bit warmer temperature, cooler temperature. Yeah, but you know, yeah. I'll tell you what though, Keith, if I, if, if I take the temps off, the, off those chicks and they're 100 degrees, not 103, I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest that maybe the truck temps are wrong. I mean, between the hatchery and the chick and the placement, isn't there a call transportation? Mm -hmm. So you, that is critical as well with respect to humidity and temperature. And so you could be chilling those chicks in transportation, they were having farm, if your temperature is 100 degrees and not 103 to 105, that tells me they're stressed already from the cold, but I'd rather have a cold stress chick than a heat stress chick. Yeah. I do not want chicks arriving panting. To me, that's when you have dissociation of the enterocytes, the gut, and you get that leakage. And I'd rather have a, I've seen where we, you know, we've had generators go down and, and truck temps drop dramatically low. And it's due to nature going across the Midwest. And those chick temps drop low and you know what? We pay attention to brooding, pay, increase the heat, um, make sure they get back into that comfort zone. And you know what? We don't lose many birds, but I don't want overheated chicks. Yeah. So again, you need the data. You can't make corrective actions without data. Yeah. So I've seen where people, while they're, you know, I had increased the heat to, to get them comfortable. Okay, what was their body temperature? Again, when my grandchild is sick, I don't go into the room with this and take it and hit the wall and go, oh, they got a fever. I got to take a temperature of my grandchild. Now it's on the forehead. 
that tells me what my child, grandchild was feeling at that time. So we can say that we feel that, you know, we had to increase the heat, but I would sure like to know what's going on at chick level, especially internally in the chick, how it's, how it's able to handle that environment at that time. But no, you can't, can't focus on the hatchery. I, I really love the comments you made several times in there about sit on your bucket and watch, sit on your bucket and watch, you know, watching birds and letting them talk to you. Um, you know, along with the data you're talking about collecting is again, the feedback that chicks give you. For instance, I, I was with some customers internationally several years ago and they said, our temperatures are all perfect in this house. But I said, but look at your chicks, they're laying on their sides panting. They go, but our temperatures, our data says they're perfect. Well, I don't really care. So again, combination of the two, correct? 100%. Yep. 100%. 100%. Got to do to, both. It goes back to, you know, stock sense is something that stockmanship was something we use in, in Europe, yep. et cetera, and the ability of the stock, stock person to, to do things. Flock yep. sense is not a word. I created that. We need flock sense. We need to use our, our given talents in observation, smell, taste, feel, etc. cetera. I'm not saying you got to eat feed with Coban in it. It could be quite precarious. But would you drink the water? And if you walk into a barn and smell ammonia, do you think maybe I need to change the management to have a better environment? If I see birds huddling and not steady state, do you think I might have to tweak the ventilation and or humidity and or temperature to create a better environment for those birds? Because there's no room for air anymore. In the past, we could just say a trigger pan can go down, they will, they will, they will catch up. Uh, water line goes down. They'll, no, they won't. They won't. There's no room for air anymore. The, the, the thing, are, yeah, what I used to be taught in school, a lot of us were, is the compensatory growth of animals. Yeah. Well, that's when we're, they're not racehorses. Like, like you mentioned in your talk, these things are, they're going, and, and there's no time for compensatory growth because they're going. They're going to go full speed. And Keith, so we don't really see that. You and I can have a 100 yard dash, okay? I don't know who would win at after 100 yards, but if I tripped and fell out of the starting blocks, you're going to beat me. Yeah. Unless if I fell too. If, yeah. it was a if it was a marathon, I probably could catch up, right? Yeah. But there's exactly. no room for error. You, these, they're, they're growing. And under intensified farming systems, and I, please, this is not factory farming. This is intensified farming with chicks growing five grams an hour with genetic opportunities. As some gentleman in research told me, we leave 30% of the genetic potential on the floor of the barn. Why? Well, certain percentages are heritable. Growth rate might be, say, 30% heritable. Okay? But what is the other 70%? It's environment, management, health, and nutrition. Yep. So we need to focus on that. Now, day, first seven days, I got two guys that work for me, Matt and Mark, who do a great job on the breeder side. I don't do as much breeder. I will go to placements. But I'm not going to interfere with their managerial techniques and opportunity and support and growing and, and production period. But we need to focus, focus on the neonates, right? It's absolutely critical. In a five-gallon bucket, we understand behavior. No different children in the playground. You want the little group, you know, huddling and talking, some playing. You want steady state. If you sit on that five-gallon bucket, then you realize that, you know, maybe a water line's down because I got these birds running around chasing looks like a grasshopper, but they're stressed because the water line has been shut down, not turned back on. So without, without observing the birds, how can you make managerial changes? You can't. Right. Um, you and I talked about this a little bit before. Um, okay, so what, um, what, what, not precautions or what extra things should should broiler managers do if they get chicks from say a very young breeder flock or a very old breeder flock i mean you know what you and i discussed this a little bit before but in yeah. summary what can they do well i mean depending on the placements hatcheries will give flock source ages right and if you have a flock source of 28 week old birds and a flock source of 60 week old birds then communication is critical so with 28 week old birds, I'd like to try to identify the boxes. And then in Canada, we have some two story barns. I put them on the second story. Heat rises, they will probably do better under a better heated environment. They don't have the cement floor. Cement usually depletes the heat a little bit quicker. 
And um, so younger breeder flocks with the communication, I would probably have them on starter feed a little bit longer. I would monitor them critically for their weights and how they were doing. I would also look at the opportunity to lower the water lines and provide water and at all means at all times under the proper uh, volume. Uh, feed, I would make sure it was dispersed more, et cetera, and I would keep my attention to detail. I'd walk the chicks more, I would observe them more, I would spend more time. I mean, younger breeder flocks usually have higher maternal antibodies. So, I mean, you got to look at some of the positives too. A younger breeder flock, higher maternal antibody, that could be also awesome as, as you know, maternal antibody depletes over time. But the question is, is what percentage of the birds are young versus old? What is the variance in the source of the flock ages, right? I mean, if you got 15, 20 weeks between young and older, it's more of a challenge and it would be nice to have those birds allocated to a different chamber. If you mix them, I always focus on the younger breeder flock opportunity. You might want to lower water line down a little bit more than, the, than raising them too quickly after three, four days. So you, then you could have a starve out, right? So again, it's monitoring the birds daily, look at the behavior, what percentage are from young breeder source flocks, and if I can allocate them to the second floor and or a different chamber, then I will do such. But I would focus a little, again, depending on the percentage of Young breeders, source flocks, I would focus on them. Okay. Yep. Big ones will do well. Okay, so this question, you answered it three times consecutively early on, but it's been asked several more times again, so I'm going to let you do it again. So what do we do if we get um, vent pasting in the first week and what caused it? Overheating. I mean, where does the overheating? Three occur? times, right? Overheating, overheating. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, overheating. I mean, you could look at nutrition and salt levels, et cetera, but... Um, you just got to get back into the environment. doesn't mean they're dead. It just means they were overheating. We caused a little bit of gut impairment, a little bit of leakage in the pasting of the bum, but then we got to get into the barn and make sure that we pay attention to the flaws going forward. Again, what percentage of the birds are, you know, I you hear, I got all these pasted bums. Well, what percentage? Well, it's 4%. It's not 100%. We still need to focus on the 96. Those birds will, they'll, they'll, they'll come around. But we still need to pay attention to the detail of the of the managerial input of flaws going forward. The world doesn't fall apart. I mean, neonates get challenged, but the challenge is is the opportunity to get them back going again. Their uniformity might be off a little bit, but if we provide the proper flaws in the environment, the management that is important, with good health and nutrition, we'll get back on track. And I mean, if you have three birds, you want to dip their bum in soapy water and clean it off. Well, with 30,000 birds, we're not going to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we can't. It doesn't mean they all have to be euthanized. Not at all. But what we have to do is pay attention to detail moving yep. forward. And we also have to understand where did they get overheated? You know? yep. And that's what, so it doesn't happen again. But I've seen barns where they have been overheated at day of age and, and we need to evaluate what their chick tents were. And if they're 106, 107, they were overheated in yep. the barn. But if they come off the truck at 103, 104, and then, you know, day three, day four, we have these pasted bums and but we got temperatures above where 105, 106. I mean, these bronze thermometers are great. They're not invasive, but you probably have to add on what 0 0.4, 0 0.5 degrees on them, right? Um, versus an internal pro, but I worry about internal pros because of gut integrity. But these are, you know, into the vent, and then, you know, if you got 105.5, then it's probably 105.9 or 106, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and they, you know, buy a new one every year type thing. And change the cap if you use it on yourself. As we noticed, you did, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay, it, if... Um, Question is spiking mortality, hypoglycemia around day, ten, day 12, 10 to 12 in the broilers. Could that be caused by that poor brooding in that first week? Possibly. Yep. Yep. Availability to feed. You don't want them to starve. Yep. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so it can for sure. Then you can get, you know, sugar solutions, et cetera, which is another topic, but um, for sure. Do improper, you have any? Go ahead. Well, just improper brooding can create a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of challenges. I mean, gut integrity, enterococcus, sequorum even, you know, hatchery, hatchery, hatchery. Yeah, we got to look at the hatchery, of course. But I've seen growers where they change hatcheries still have enterococcus sequorum. Mm -hmm. 
So there's no room for gut integrity and balance. We need to make sure that gut integrity is, is maximized, optimized 24 seven. Birds go with it. You've seen, you go into these barns and look at chicken poop. I had professors that would come in and have 400 slides of dog, dog poop and tell me what their gastrointestinal challenges were or whatever. And go into a barn. I think there's some posters of chicken poop, you know, and they, it tells you. I mean, if you see a, an orangey, slimy chicken poop, was there a challenge with respect to a trigger pan going down, a water line going down? How did we disturb that gut and balance? We want steady state. It's critical. These birds perceive change. Yep. And when you change and you don't respond to it, if changes occur and you don't respond to it, they will respond and hopefully you don't have to react. You don't want to search for a therapeutic. Preventive so medicine is critical. If you've, got, if you've got a group of chicks that come in and, and following transport, um, questions following transport, they come in and uh, the vent temps dropped about 38C, which is, you know, 100.5, something like that, Fahrenheit. Um, what, what would you, what are the negative and uh, potential ne negative impacts of that for the grow out, the seven, even 14 days? I had, you know, I haven't seen, in, in terms of parent stock, et cetera, when I've seen when temperatures drop like that, I haven't seen as much impairment on broiler growth and performance parameters as I have with overheating. So if they come in and they're chilled, I want to get them into the brooding chamber and be there. Place them, come back in two, three, four hours and start working with the brooding chamber to create the need for them to start seeking feed and water when they establish and feel more comfortable. So if they're lethargic coming in and they're chilled to that point of a 99.5 or 100, 105, then I, 100.5, then I want to make sure my brooding chamber is uniform, consistent to provide the heat for them to get going again. And I would be in there with my thermometer to make sure that those temperatures are coming up. So in that case, it may be more of a, they're, they're a little bit slower getting going again, but like on the hot side, there's actual damage to the chick that can affect them long-term. So we really don't exactly. see the long-term. Exactly. Cool, right? yep. um, did you see a relate, just a couple more questions here. Um, been on here and had your time for a long time. Um, do you see a relationship between um, elevated CO2 in the hatcher and um, chick quality, uh, CITES, uh, different things like that, that might be a, a result of high CO2 in the hatcher? I'm not, I'm not an expert on hatchery. That's why we have Aline and Eddie and Diana and everybody else that we have in our company and then, of course, resources like yourself. But I do know, and I need to do more. COVID-19 stopped me from getting into the field to look at more carefully the effect of high CO2 on muscle integrity. I really believe that a barn is not necessarily a chamber for high CO2. Some of our, you know, and we got sensors now that are, are, are gauging ventilation on humidity and temperature and possibly CO2. There is growers I know that gauge ventilation on CO2 and they want it around 2,500 ppm. I don't want high CO2 um, at all. And I think it can have some challenges with, with muscle integrity, satellite cell development, hypoxia of that nature. I don't know that yet. More data has to be gathered. But I believe there's a threshold of acceptance for CO2. What scares me right. now today in these airtight barns key is that when we go in with our probe and measure the CO2, it could be 3,500. Barn doors are opened up, there's movement. What's happening at 2 o'clock in the morning? And that's why I believe in 24-7. I want to know what's going on 24-7. That's why data is critical. I can go in and inspect at one time, and what I do is I'll go in a big barn and maybe four different quadrants. I'll pick up 20 birds, do their temps, do their crop fill. I'll do CO2, I'll do temperature and humidity. And always there's variance in the bar. Yeah. And there's weight differences. But what scares me is if we go 24 7 with CO2 or CO or whatever, even ammonia, what's going on at two o'clock in the morning in the house? And there's when, especially in air type. When we're out there, yeah. You know, why is it that old barns do better sometimes than new barns, right? There's probably air leakage. You know, why is it we see some musmopathies better? much better in older barns than newer barns. Is it just growth rate? I don't know. Is it CO2? 
Don't know. So data becomes critical to make decisive mm -hmm. decisions going forward. But I can't tell you about CO2 in the hatchery. I do know that versus multi-stage and single stage, you're the expert. But on farm, it's something we need to pay more attention to. Yep. Okay. Um, 24 seven. Um, what, one more question, then we'll, then we'll let you go for now because there's a lot more questions that maybe you can help us answer afterwards. Um, but um, we talk about the importance of monitoring farm temperature at various locations in the house. So what is your thoughts on um, monitoring those temperatures through like thermal imaging or anything in a, in a house to really yeah. look at different spots of that house? Well, I mean, the FLIR camera tells you a lot rather than just a dot. I, you know, I really believe in, therm in precision livestock farming. I really do. Whether it be robotics, or thermography, or remote video auditing, I think the future is a lot. Not only with respect to the temperature in the barn, but also thermography maybe on the temperature of the bird. Um, you know, high temperatures of the bird could be fever, could be related to a lot of things, right, besides environmentally. But the pattern of in the barn is what's important. I mean, you know, Michael's done a lot of work. I mean, he is the, he birthed and he was, he stimulated everybody to look at, you know, floor imaging and barns and try to make better managerial decisions on improvements. Tremendous work that they have done down there. And not only with respect to insulation and deterioration due to darkling beetles, uh, wet litter, et cetera, and, um, you know, critical, critical that way, but, I believe thermography is going to be a thing of the future. It's called precision livestock farming. What scares me is that right now we talk in the first seven, 10 days, Keith. I think the litter probe is an awesome opportunity to gauge in the barn where the chicks are exposed to at their level, where the rubber hits the pavement, what the temperature is. And I encourage the, these companies to look at relative humidity too. What scares me more, because you know, companies like Ross, you know, in, in who I work for and, and truly, truly appreciate all the technical support, et cetera. Um, we can give a global interpretation of humidity and temperature over that broader period. What scares me is the back end, the last week, 10 days. I've seen where litter temperatures were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit and the probes were set at 68. You get these broilers on, the, on these floors, Keith, it's like a duvet. Turkeys will stand up, air circulates under them. You get these broilers on the floor, it's like a duvet. They sit there. And they trap in this heat. That scares the poop out of me, right? Is that we need to get them up and move around to get this heat circuit, get this heat dispersed. Yeah. So I think in the future, we're going to not only look at the first seven, 10 days of, of, of our temperatures and the need with respect to relative humidity, but the back seven, 10 days as well. No doubt. So I don't know if I answered your question, but thermography will be a thing of the future. Yeah, yeah. And better opportunity moving forward will be based on that farm and the behavior and performance of those birds that we get through data collection. In, in my opinion on that, all that technology is great additions to farming, but like the flock sense you talked about, the, the uh, you know, animal husbandry can't be taken away. We still have to have that. Keith, I went to one farm and they had all the Michael Schurmacher steering wheels, okay? I walk in the barn, walk around, there's three, there's dead chicks in the pan, pans that have been there three, four days. That means they don't have their MBA degree managed by being around or walking around. Right. Yeah. Right, we got, what's the first three letters of the word management? Man. Man. Fingers in the pulse, it's going to be a degree, you know. You got to be there. And uh, I'm not an expert in this, but boy, I tell you, you sit on that five gallon bucket, and I got one here, it cost, cost me $4, and using them for planters now, too. You turn that upside down, and I would highly recommend that we have our brooding list here. That's upside down, that when we're sitting on it, we can read it. Like this, it's upside down. And we need to go through that checklist. We need to go through that checklist. And use flaws as a principle as the acronym of where to start. Because a lot of times people, where do I start? I'll start with picking up a chick and observing its quality. And then use your flock sense to evaluate the flaws, food, lighting, air, water, and space. Yes, meters and everything, but I'll tell you, in Africa, it's amazing. You can talk about the principles, and they're so innovative to create things they need to better have chick health and health. 
Yeah. Right? They don't need all these tools, but the best tool that they got is this, 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 right? And they can actually observe. And then crop fill to me is the number one. You don't need all these multi fancy machinery to do crop fill. It takes time. But time is an investment. You're not spending time, you're investing time. So crop Food fill to crop me makes them grow. Time. Food in the yep. crop makes them grow. Yep. That's 100%. Yep. 100%. Um, all right. Well, there'll be, there'll be some more questions that um, those that have asked questions here will get a response back by emails with quite a few more. Um, uh, we've been here quite a while, taking up a lot of Scott's time at this point, but very much appreciate um, all the, the information, the, the kind of finishing up this two-part series about the chick. Last week, learned about chick assessing in the hatchery, and then Scott took us into, okay, how do we take that good chick? out to the farm and get the best results and just fabulous information. Check out.